Hi, everybody. My name is Maria Carolla. I'm CMO of Steldex. And today we're joined for our crypto interview series by Louise and Marvin from Stex. Hi, guys. I'm Louise. You guys should say hi. Yeah. Like hi. The, yeah. <laughs> And today is actually a very special interview series because it's the first time we do an interview not with one, but with two representatives of the project that we support, which is awesome. And we'll see how it goes. And obviously, at first, I'm just going to let you introduce yourself and tell a little bit about what you do at Stacks. Yeah, perfect. Um, I could go first because I prepared for like a little short story for you guys because I always feel I cut it short, you know, like in the beginning, like Genesis post. So yeah, um, I'm going to, because the main question is like, how did we go into the blockchain space, right? So I'm going to do a little bit of like rewind because my journey dates back to 2017, 2016. And I was always like watching from afar. I remember when I first entered like the blockchain.com, you know, site and I was like, Oh fuck, there's so many numbers, transaction numbers. I was like, I don't understand anything. And I'm like, okay, maybe I take a pass, you know, and maybe it's not for me. I heard Bitcoin cool. Okay. I, Cause I was studying IT. So, you know, probably it's like a tuck of down. And then it wasn't until early 2017 when I dig deeper about the history of like web platforms and history of digital cultures. That's what, that's, I think this time that I started going deep down in the space I was in the second year of my master's and I was doing a lot of research on that specific topic. So for example, what was the first social network that was created and how did it actually brought value to society? And the more I dig deeper, I became just invested in like the whole topic of like web 2.0 platforms, you know? I'm trying to learn as much as I could. For example, I'm gonna give you a little bit of facts. The first social networking site was actually from the Netherlands and they called it like the digital stad in Dutch. And then in English, they call it the digital city. And um, so as you can see, there's so many more counterparts now. And uh, you can see different unique characteristics of these platforms and why did it fail, you know? And the more you look at platforms now and platforms before, you always see similarities that we usually overlook and you usually see the same problems and how this platform will reach their breaking point. And that's what I did a lot of research on. And I think this is where blockchain comes in because you introduce a new technology that could actually solve the problem that was introduced by Web 2.0, you know, such as like Amazon, Facebook, and all these tech giants. For example, you have, well, gardens, you have these big corporations that just monopolizes the entire industry that therefore they hinder innovation. And I think that was the sticking factor to me. That's why I went into this space deeply and I was like, this is it, you know, this is like a game changer. I know it's a high because I feel like that's what everybody says, but like that was kind of like my deal in the space. So yeah, and then that's pretty much my story on how I get into the space. Oh, this is great. What about you, Marvin? Um, I think we all have similar stories, right? I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll try to keep this uh, this short, but um, I, I was just always interested in the web industry. So uh, even even from a very young age, it, it just fascinated me the idea that um, you know you could be doing something on your computer, but this could reach someone that is on the other side of the world, right? So, so I, I think this spoke to the imagination of many many people. Um, so that's how I, I first got into the web and I was like, I want to be able to do this myself. I want to be able to build web applications and figure out how all this works. And this always fascinated me. So then I, I guess naturally at one point I landed on, on crypto, uh, obviously Bitcoin is my, was my first introduction and that's, that started out like pretty, um, in a pretty straightforward manner, you know, like uh, you work online and then suddenly there's this, this, this weird person who reaches out and it's like, yeah, can I just pay you in Bitcoin instead for these reasons? And I'm like, all right, well, what's this Bitcoin thing? You know, that's, that's really how I got started. And I was like, well, you know, you want to make it easy for, for the people that you work with. Right. So I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll take the Bitcoin thing. And then I had to figure out like, okay, well, what, what can I do with this? And that sort of uh, sent me down the rabbit hole um, uh, skip forward a few years. And I switched from just doing, um, web to or legacy web apps to just full on blockchain applications and whatnot. Uh, worked as a smart contract engineer for a few years, so uh, you know that naturally that would mean Ethereum. Um, 
and then after a while i got introduced to to stacks and um that was also just like a random discovery that i made so uh, i came across uh, their website at the time it was called blockstack and they were advertising the decentralized internet and and uh, you could download a browser to the decentralized internet and I was like, well, what does that mean? You know, I was, I was in, I was in the crypto space. It's like a decentralized internet. That sounds like a level kind of beyond, right? Um, so I, I, I downloaded it. I, it didn't work pretty well, but it did something. And uh, I signed up for the newsletter, and that's how, how I, uh, I first got involved with Stacks. And, uh, and then suddenly, um, it took flight, and they started doing all these amazing things. And I was like, man, I got to be part of this. This makes so much sense to me. And uh, just the way Stacks works, and then uh, once uh, Clarity, so the, the the smart contract language for um, for Stacks was released, that was such a breath of fresh air to me. Um, it's, it's pretty different in the way it looks and how it functions, but you know, coming from uh, Solidity and thinking that I'm I'm a decently competent developer, it's pretty tricky to get it right. So you know, you'd see a lot of people around you getting things wrong, and Clarity just uh, design wise made a lot of sense, and. Um, yeah, that convinced me, and I, I got I got very involved in stacks, and uh, I um, and I yeah stuck around. That's it. You have like very. Sorry, yeah, go for yeah. it. Go for it, Maria. Now I was gonna say disclaimer, both Marvin and I were community members before we became part of the team. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You both have like yeah. a very solid approach. It's like you see it, you get interested, then you get involved. This is like this makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think that's a really valid point. So we, we've had people like, oh, you're just a founding member or something like that. And it's like, no, I started as a community member. So when like when I speak, like I, I don't have like a vested interest, like I, I did not invent clarity or something like that. Right. Uh, like some of the other founding members, I came in as a community member, just like Lois, and I stuck around. And uh, I would also have to say, like, I, I've been part of many different communities in one form or another. And um it, it never resonated to the amount it did with stacks and and you know that's yeah that's why i stuck around and i guess for lois it's very different very Insane. similar you know, yeah. it's like you have your set of friends and you just found them you're not gonna like throw them around you know i think that's like one of the easiest metaphor for it you just like find your pack I'm like okay this yeah. is my crew i stay here <laughs> yeah it's really like uh like finding your tribe yeah yeah this is awesome to hear that you're so engaged and involved. Actually, one of the questions afterwards will be about community. But first, you got everybody so excited about Stacks and about the community. So could you please explain what Stacks actually is for those who have never heard about it before, who don't know how it works, and just explain it as easily as possible and what it does, probably like this. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take the first stab on it because... And this is like a quick analogy on just what Stack says. So if I would explain it to a five-year-old or my grandparents, I would say to them, think of Stacks as like the girlfriend of Bitcoin, you know? It just makes Bitcoin better. <laughs> so, and for so long, we're in like the narrative of like digital gold, oh, Bitcoin can't be used for payments, you know? It's nothing more than like a store of value. And I think this is what's special about Stacks. It comes in and it brings in apps and smart contracts to Bitcoin without modifying it. And I think that's what's so special about it. So that's like me pitching you what Stacks is in like... <laughs> Yeah. Elevator pitch. When I'm you at the elevator, you ask me what stacks is. That's what I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's um, do all like the technical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's this uh, recurring uh, phrase that we keep hearing throughout the community. Uh, I think that the team at Residio came up with it, but don't quote me on that one. But they they say like, if Bitcoin is gold, then then stacks is kind of turning that gold into jewelry. Um, and and oh, why do you say that? One. Yeah, I like it, right? It's 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 nice, but but the reason they say that is because uh, and here comes the technical spiel. Um, Stacks is a layer one blockchain, uh, but it uses Bitcoin for for finality. So uh, that means that it actually uh, is. It, it's a bit of a misnomer to say it's built on top, but that's a way how you could visualize this because um, so Stacks is its own chain, uh, mines its own blocks, but it uses. Um, a, a special consensus mechanism that ties it to Bitcoin. So every so often, uh, there's what is called an anchor block. And this anchor block is actually encoded in the Bitcoin chain as a transaction. 
So um, by doing it that way, it leverages the existing security and the existing proof of work that's done by Bitcoin. So that makes Stacks a really secure chain uh, by sort of repurposing uh, the work spent to secure the Bitcoin chain. So um, uh, there's a few reasons for that. Obviously, like one of the first is like, if you want to start a new chain, it's very difficult to get a proof of work chain going. You need a, a large investment by a lot of people that want to commit their resources towards securing the chain. And, and obviously there's also an environmental question, right? If there's so many proof of work chains that are running. So um, um, at Stacks, they, they thought like, well, why not just reuse repurpose this energy that's already being used and that's kind of where that parable comes from like if bitcoin is gold then then stacks is taking that and turning it into jewelry the gold has already been mined right we're not going out on our own to mine gold but we're repurposing this um so that's 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 uh stacks and then yeah what, as lewis said what stacks brings is um a smart contract language so it makes bitcoin programmable in different ways because uh the stacks chain uh by virtue of the way it's built has um, insight into the base layer chain. So in, in Bitcoin. So if you're writing a smart contract, uh, you can actually um, create triggers based on something that happened on the Bitcoin chain. And, and that's pretty unique. Yeah. And we always know that smart contracts are like the holy grail. Smart contracts on Bitcoin are like the holy grail in crypto. You know, if you can do it, that means you're onto something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like usually when you talk about smart smart contracts, when you talk about applications layer two, all this stuff, we think Ethereum because this is the programmable chain that everybody knows, everybody builds on it. It's super overcrowded, but like, well. Uh, so, what is actually what is the key difference in having stacks built on Bitcoin, and why is it better than the usual ways of everybody building something on top of Ethereum? You want to take that, Marvin? Uh, sure. Um, I, I think, like, um, you know, there's many different perspectives to this. So uh, I, I think this this is is also um, partly opinion based. But if I would approach this personally, I would say, like, well, you know, I, I think Ethereum uh, they pioneered a lot of great things. So you know, what we what we've seen on Ethereum is the emergence of um, tokens that are being built on a different chain. So we have standards like ERC twenty, we have ERC seven twenty ones, and ERC eleven fifty fives, and that's all uh, very fascinating stuff. Um, but why I made the switch personally. Uh, was because of a number of reasons. So, uh, like I said, solidity is tricky to get right, and and you know, I know, like with with time and education, you can get this done. It's definitely not something you can't overcome. But um, Ethereum has seen lots of many devastating events. So we saw uh, the issue with the DAO. We saw the parity bug, uh, and, and you know, just, just there's there's too many to list. Honestly, uh, ways in which people have either lost their their tokens or they got locked up in a contract that that crashed, and um, when Clarity was developed, it was really standing on the shoulders of giants, right? So it, it could see at all the issues that were happening in Ethereum and in different spaces. And it, it built a lot of securities into the language that I think make a lot of sense. So, uh, you, you know, you obviously have heard of re-entrancy bugs before. That's that's a thing on Ethereum. Um, that's already de facto impossible in, in Clarity. So it's it's you cannot do re-entrant calls. It, it wouldn't work. It will just get rejected. Um, I, I won't get into all the technical uh specifics there of what what other things are built in but you know that's sort of like the, the design principles behind clarity uh, another thing i really like is that uh on stacks they have a mechanism that is called post conditions um and that means that um the the user that is sending a transaction can assert like from the onset uh to say like well after this transaction gets mined this is what should have happened so that translates into i do this contract call and then exactly 500 stacks tokens should have been transferred uh and if that doesn't happen the call is reverted so that means that if there's some sort of glitch or an attack that tries to drain your wallet that's that's impossible right if you have a specific token what makes that more interesting is that um, because we we saw this emergence of of all these different types of tokens like fungible and non-fungible tokens is that actually built into the language for clarity so if you want to mint your own token it's very easy built into the language and with that also comes a lot of security so you, you cannot get like overflows or underflows so um 
if you specify a specific supply, that's exactly what it's going to be until the end of times. Um, and then also the post condition mechanism ties into that. So if you create an NFT, you can also secure them with those same post conditions. And I think that's, that's very fascinating. Um, so with all of that in mind, and then also the fact that if, if we look at the security of the chain by itself, so Ethereum is, is a proof of work transferring to uh, some, some form of proof of stake. Um, but Bitcoin is by far the most secure chain, just given the amount of work that's put into it. So uh, it, it just makes sense that if you want to build an app and you need the highest degree of security, you want to do that on Stacks because Stacks leverages Bitcoin. Um, so, so those are some of the main reasons I, I think it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so th that, that makes a lot of sense, the security and the, are there any like ma major uh, differences in use cases? So you said that it's easier to make tokens, for example. So is, is this kind of making stacks more um, kind of flattering to businesses, for example, because you mentioned businesses on your website and you say that it makes easier uh, like the use cases for businesses are easier on stacks and it's like more usable. And can, can you tell more about this like business usage of stacks? I think to just to chime in this specific topic. So I think for example, DeFi, right? So DeFi, you might want to put it in a smart contract that's like predictable and does it allow for experimentation? And I think that's what stacks is good at. You know, for example, you have clarity, which is a smart Contract that's like predictable. And when you put DeFi on it, so whatever you put on the code, it executes it. For example, if you put it in smart contracts, maybe like in Ethereum, you never know where, where the code is going to end up. You know what I mean? Because that's how they design solidity. So, for example, those are, I think, use cases where stacks fit strongly with, you know? And then I think it, it just, by the end of the day, it depends on which platform do you want to build it as a developer because maybe there are some characteristics that resonates to you the most with ethereum then you go with ethereum you know what i mean but then if you mm. go for like security and all this kind of stuff maybe stacks is a better choice for you yeah yeah i think uh, that's like it, it's it's tough to like kind of uh, issue a blanket statement on that right like oh it's a business choosing this or that like it, you know obviously ethereum has a, a lot higher like higher adoption so it, it might make sense if you, for instance, want to uh, mint an NFT and sell it, that you'd go to Ethereum because this might be an existing user base or marketplace that you want to be on, uh, or you might have different considerations. So uh, Stacks is, uh, as far as I know, the only SEC approved uh, token offering ever. So that offers like a degree of security for maybe um, specific compliance institutions, right? Or compliance regulations, right? So that might tie into if, if uh, it's a business in the US, that might make sense. Um, uh, the other aspect being uh, the, the security aspect. So if you are doing something highly sensitive and you need the highest degree of security uh, in terms of hash power, you, you, you'd go with stacks, for example. Um, and, and then, yeah, the, the upsides to clarity. So there's just many, many considerations to make. Uh, and then finally, I guess there, there's also a, a huge amount of capital locked up in Bitcoin. Um, so if, if that's something that you want to target as a business, then, then stacks would, I would say also be a, a contender. Yeah, that makes sense. You already mentioned that there is this thought that Ethereum, for example, has a user base, has marketplaces that are known. And if you want to like make NFTs, then you go with them because it's pretty obvious, but you have the technology there definitely. And you have security. Uh, how do you promote these ideas and what Stack does to kind of spread adoption and get users to know it better and to understand the values of it, to understand the upsides of it? Uh, so are how you're spreading ideas of Stacks helping to solve the problems that people might stumble upon? Lois, maybe you, you're, okay. <laughs> all about, you're all about growth. Yeah, so that's a kind of my forte. I specialize in like token and community and like the intersection of both fields. So I think in terms of um, protocols, especially in the crypto space, one of the key for success is building your community from the ground up. And I think that's what 
one of the things that stacks stand out the most you know so we have a tiny community that's exponentially growing um ever since like for example me or marvin join you see the same faces you know but like for the past i think one or two years there's just like so many faces that's like in it and the and now on how we distribute ideas usually we have this like tight core hardcore evangelists that preach about the project. Same as Bitcoin, you know, you know Bitcoin through these Bitcoin maxis because they can't just stop talking about it. And the same with Stacks. We have this like hardcore evangelist that talks about Stacks. If you check my Twitter, Marvin's Twitter, we talk about Stacks and Bitcoin, you know, and I think that's like one way to amplify in a project because by the end of the day, the best form of marketing is not will not come from Stacks. It will come from people who actually believe in it. And we're proud to say that, for example, in terms of growth and sentiment around the token, we have 354,000 and 222 stacks holders. And this is actually distributed across more than 32 countries around the globe. And within our Telegram groups, we have more than 20 Telegram groups with almost more than 50,000 members totally. And those are just like some of the numbers that we have in terms of traders, investors, and just total sentiment around the token. Mm -hmm. yeah and uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in in, in the um, idea of build it and they will come so uh you, you build just amazing technology and and people get passionate about it and they start sort of you know they pick it up and they run with it so there there's a lot of innovation already happening on the platform so we have uh people building nfts and and they're very successful maybe uh lois you can you can say like a few words about residio and then yeah oh yeah so we have like a few projects thank you for mentioning marvin so we have because we always probably know that okay nfts is like ethereum you know they take it over they have like the biggest like nft kind of space so we're actually picking up quite um fast at stacks for example like what marvin mentioned we have residio and residio just finished their this is number one campaign it's for actually cara delevin fat boy slim and anonymous artists like chemical x minted their nfts and these are like the first sets are these sets of nfts that's actually minted on bitcoin through through stacks and and there's more coming down in the in, in the pipeline and uh, yeah i wish i could share more and there's more nft companies that's coming out of stacks so for example you also have boom layer um record shop momentum there's a lot and i think that's what's exciting about the ecosystem because like in the next three to six months you're gonna see these companies just go out on stacks and it's pretty exciting yeah, yeah so it, it's it's just fun to see passionate people build and uh, we just try to support it in every way so uh we we have two ways to get that done we have a, a grant program at the stacks foundation so if you um have an idea that you're passionate about so this doesn't necessarily have to be like a developer project it could be anything so we've we've seen people um write blog posts or create videos educational content uh it can be anything and uh if if it moves forward the mission of uh bringing about the user on the internet then then it's it's open for funding so you can submit a grant proposal uh, this gets reviewed and then you can get resources to start building or creating what it is that you want to create. And then beyond that, we also uh, recently launched the Stacks Accelerator. So this is uh, run by Trevor Owens and his team. And they, uh, they have these high velocity, high impact teams that are building on Stacks right now. So they get funding, they get mentorship and, and uh, this is open to everyone. So anyone can send in an application. So if, if you know, your team, you want to build something and, and you're like, yeah, maybe stacks make sense. Then, then you can reach out to them and, uh, you know, who knows? So that those are all different ways in which we try to support people and, and sort of get the word out and, and get them to try out the technology. And we're always looking for these, these genuine responses and then we also have the chapter program right there was this yeah so I guess those are more so for community builders like me if you feel like oh i don't really have the technical skills i can't really develop any apps you know how can i get involved with the project so you can actually start your own little communities you know it could be a community around DeFi, it could be a community around nfts it's a localized community maybe in lithuania you know whatever mm -hmm. community we want to build we want to support it because that's one way to actually expand the project yeah, this is great. Uh, I had this question about whether Stacks is actually the community-driven project, but I guess you answered it already, like to to the we max. We are. 
it's you very, it's very hands off. Yeah, like everyone can contribute to anything, and then yeah. diff- there are different entities in the space that just try to support it, or yeah. they're spin-offs and they start doing their own thing. So the Stacks Foundation is just one of many, and uh, uh, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's very community focused. And I think it's worth mentioning here. Um, Stacks actually went to the process of decentralization. So for example, when me and Marvin came in as community members before, it was actually named Blockstack PBC and Blockstack PBC was actually working towards releasing Stacks 2.0. And at the release of Stacks 2.0, Blockstack PBC actually diminished and there's five new companies that was born within the ecosystem. And all of these entities are working towards tax adoption. And now there's more companies in it. For example, 25 companies coming out of the accelerator also jumping in and more and more entities. So you yeah. can think of stacks as just like an open permissionless network like Bitcoin. Yeah. Nobody- and then there's just a whole bunch of community entities as well. Yeah. So I, I honestly, I don't know how many it's uh, there are a lot. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> so how does this uh, all action uh that happens on stacks gets controlled. Uh, so is there the foundation that kind of monitors everything and kind of does some project management work for all these companies or are they kind of like self-sufficient and they do everything in completely decentralized manner? I, I think that's a really good question because when people hear Stacks Foundation, they might draw a parallel to say Ethereum Foundation, right? And Ethereum Foundation, they have a, a large hand in kind of what, what happens to the network and what gets in, included in the nodes, uh, in the code base. Stacks Foundation is not like that at all. So it's it's a very hands-off approach. And, and uh, you know, like we, we help out, but we help out when, when we're being asked. So that means like grant proposals, someone wants to build something, you know, they need funding for that, uh, things like that. So um, what actually happens in the ecosystem is all up for for a vote. So there's different ways that's being done. Some is off-chain voting and then other other things uh, are on-chain voting. And, you know, uh, they're exploring different governance mechanisms. Uh, they uh, meeting the community on uh, on how to make this as transparent and and. Um, uh, good as possible so uh, it's moving to more on-chain voting but uh, the stacks foundation just has a supporting role in in these things when when it's asked if, if that makes sense so uh, just like ethereum has uh, ethereum improvement proposals we have uh, we have sips so stacks improvement proposals those get posted on github everyone can post anything they like there uh, everyone can review it and those are being voted upon and usually there's like a a way, uh, a mechanism to ratify these or or not, um, and and uh, when that comes to pass, yeah, the, these SIPs are included. So, for example, um, um, a community member actually su- uh, submitted a, a SIP for an NFT standard, so that did not come out of the foundation or any of the entities. Uh, so that's SIP nine, and that that was ratified. So that's an NFT standard, and then there's one in the works, uh, SIP ten, which is a fungible token standard. And these are all community proposals and, uh, and also voted on. And, and yeah, so it's very, it's very hands-off. The Stacks Foundation just supports uh, the same with the chapters. Uh, all the chapters are autonomous. They can do what they want, basically. And, uh, and they just, we, we just work with them like, hey, how can we support you in any way? Let us know. So it just definitely can be called like truly decentralized. You go for everything that you want to get in everything that you want to kind of accept from the community or suggest, which is cool. And this is actually good to know that there are decentralized projects that don't end up in a in fights and arguments over like the, the stuff that people want to do because this is the first concern probably of people who are hearing about decentralized projects that are like, oh no, they, they, yeah, everybody's there, there's, gonna argue there's this no... is- yeah, exactly. There's no steering committee that is going to unilaterally decide like, okay, this is what we're going to do with, with Stacks uh, 2.0 or something like that. Everything is up for a vote and open for discussion and anyone can contribute if they want to. So, uh, um, you know, we're not going to hard fork something away because uh, some people don't like it. <laughs> you know, like we, don't even, we don't have the capability, you know, nobody has that capability. <laughs> Amazing. So actually talking about the proposals and the plans and so on. So what do you have that you can disclose uh, that is planned for the future? Let's say like not very distant future, not like five years, because 
I don't know what's going to happen in crypto in five years. Honestly, I think nobody does. But <laughs> like, I don't know, up to a year, some partnerships, collaborations, major changes, some new things, anything that you can think of and that's interesting for the community and that's cool, that you think is cool. Okay, we can chop this in like into three sections. So there's like technical stuff that we're gonna release that I think is super exciting. Marvin can shine more color in it, but on a high level, I think microblocks is definitely a game changer. So it actually reduces the transaction processing times to seconds. And and micro blocks will actually be supported in the Stacks blockchain API and tooling for faster transaction processing. And maybe Marvin, maybe you would love to. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll I'll quickly uh, jump in on that. So micro blocks. Um, um, let, let's backtrack a little bit. So because Stacks leverages uh, Bitcoin for finality, that also means that we inherit um, the other properties of Bitcoin. So you know we already talked about the security that comes with it, but what we also inherit is the block time. So Stacks blocks uh, or anchor blocks are mined at an average of ten minutes, just like Bitcoin. So. Um, that's okay for some things, but pretty annoying for other things. So if you if you're building a DEX or you a marketplace or some other DeFi solution, you know you don't necessarily want to wait uh, ten minutes or longer for that to confirm, right? So um, that's where micro blocks come in. So micro blocks are mined in between these anchor blocks. So uh, so to recap, um, an anchor block gets gets anchored to a, a Bitcoin block by means of transaction. So that's one every ten minutes, but in between there is a number of, of micro blocks and these micro blocks can settle in, in uh, a number of seconds. And then these micro blocks are eventually then confirmed again in one of these anchor blocks. So uh, that means that you reduce the confirmation time from, from 10 minutes or however long you wait to, to, uh, to seconds. So yeah, that's what Lois is talking about. Perfect. I think I think in terms of just partnerships in general, you can expect more partnerships. Like for example, the past things that we announced are a partnership with Paycoin. So that was mostly done by the Stacks Korea chapter. So they're gonna bring Stacks to seventy thousand merchants in Southeast Asia, particularly in Korea. For example, um, Seven Eleven, Domino, and other like re retail um, e-commerce. And then they can also support stacking. So stacking is where you actually lock your stack stock it in order to get Bitcoin yield. And I think this game changer, we also introduced a partnership with Injective. So we're going to bring Bitcoin derivatives to the Ethereum chain through like Injective protocol. And you can just expect more of those in the pipeline. And I think another exciting um, thing that's coming out is the teams out of the accelerator. I think Marvin, if I'm probably wrong or right, I think September, October, they will finish their cohort and then they're going to graduate and there's 25 new companies within the ecosystem from DeFi, Texas, all the way to tracking your genetic materials such as your DNA and stuff on the blockchain, we have it. So I think yeah, that's it's, it's very diverse group of people yeah. And, then, and yeah, there's some, some other things in the works that will be announced when it's ready. Um, yeah. Yeah, and when it comes from a technical standpoint, uh, there's going to be an upgrade to the Stacks chain uh, version 2.0, if you will. And uh, that brings a number of improvements to the chain. Uh, it adds some new features to Clarity to make some things easier to do. Uh, but then one big thing that it, it will introduce is uh, a modification to the consensus mechanism. So I know we didn't really talk about that, but uh, the consensus mechanism on a high level uh, has two parts. So on the one hand, you have people that have Stacks tokens and they can lock these up in a process called stacking. And on the other hand, you have miners that are building new Stacks uh, blocks and, and mining these micro blocks. So um, for the consensus mechanism to work, what the miners have to do is spend the base chain token. So this means Bitcoin. So they have to spend Bitcoin in order to be eligible for the leader election to mine the next block. And this is done by a verifiable random function. Uh, you know, we, th these details can be found online, uh, but it means that the more Bitcoin to spend, the higher the odds are that they will be the elected leader to, uh, to mine the next block. So those Bitcoins, where do those Bitcoins go that they spend? Those go to the stackers that are stacking the tokens. So the stackers lock up their stacks tokens and uh, by doing so they vote for what they believe is the canonical chain tip. And these votes are, are on chain. So, you know, everyone can see what uh, people are voting on. 
and and the miners as a thank you if you will will then send them uh, those bitcoins and and that happens uh, that that's part of the consensus mechanism so this is all uh, decentralized the way this works so that means effectively that if you have stacks tokens you can lock them up and you get a bitcoin yield so that's pretty nice and the apy on that i think currently is about like 10% uh, just for locking up your your tokens a uh, big difference between proof of stake is that there is no risk of your tokens being slashed so you lock them up you always get these tokens back and you do get your bitcoin yield if you meet the threshold of like how much you need for stacking so there's, there's, there, there's no way in which you're going to lose those tokens. They won't be slashed. Um, but the upgrade that's happening with, with Stacks 2.0, which um, might happen around August, but might be pushed back. This depends, again, on user vote. Um, the way stacking works right now is you have to lock up your tokens for a cycle, and a cycle is a number of weeks. And then after your stacking period ends, there is a, a cooldown period of one cycle. So that means you have to wait until you can stack again. So an exciting change that a lot of people are, are uh, impatiently awaiting is uh, the removal of that cooldown period. So we call that continuous stacking. So right now, say you can stack for 12 weeks and then you have to wait and then you can stack for another 12 weeks. And then once uh, Stacks 2.0 comes out, you can, you can stack continuously and uh, you can keep receiving those yields. And then, um, yeah, that a lot of people are excited for that. So we have stacking pools where you can kind of stack in a decentralized fashion. And then there's also a number of exchanges that offer a stacking product through their platform. So they're experiencing that same thing that, that people have to wait and the tokens lock up and they unlock and then they cannot stack for another period. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one of the other big things that's come. And just that's to, pretty uh, big changes in both in like business direction and in technology direction that's a lot and i like yeah. I, I didn't want to interrupt you Louise. So. no no <laughs> yeah, i'm just sorry to, add to what marvin said in terms of yielding products on bitcoin stacks is probably at the top you know if you look at maybe a uh, block for nexo sell shoes and maybe gemini earn or other exchanges like binance in terms of yielding bitcoin on your holdings Stacks has like the best APY out of all of them. And the only risk that you have is you hold Stacks as a collateral. But then in the long run, if you look at the market cap of Stacks compared to the other projects like BSC, you know, and other smart contracting platform, it's still early in the game. So we always say, oh, one of the best hidden gems in crypto is Stacks, you know, because nobody has discovered it yet, not a lot of people. And I think it will come to a point where it's like probably like you can expect it to be like a real contender in the space in terms of smart contract platform. That's very cool. And you are saying that there is all these benefits, obviously, both for users and for like potential people who want to build something up on Stacks. But still, even not saying about Stacks, but this is more going into the field of like general questions, but crypto and blockchain is still like, it's not that widely used, like no matter how we want to push it forward. And from the perspective of stacks, uh, what is important to do and what is important to achieve for people to be more interested? It, it comes both for people who trade, people who stack, people who want to do business. So it's both about like crypto trading and about blockchain technology use yeah. in whatever people do. So what do you think are important steps to kind of make this adoption happen using stacks, obviously. You want to go first, Marvin, or do you want me to go first? Uh, I, I think, yeah, you can jump on this one and I'll... Yeah, I think for, for not speaking for stacks, but just like my whole intuition in general, I think for the crypto space, one word, you know, we need to work on usability. And I think that's always the barrier for like mass adoption because a lot of the teams that you see in the space right now focuses on the protocol level. You know, how do we create network bridge? How do we create cross-chain swaps with all these assets? You know, how do we actually, there's just so many technical jargon. And for like a normal user, if you talk to my friends, they're like, you know, zone out. They don't understand anything. And I think... If you want to go to the kind of like mass adoption um, phase, 
uh, we want to probably eliminate all these like heavy technical jargon and focus more on the usability aspects of these projects, you know? So for example, um, I'm going to give you a specific occurrence. So I, it was just like the past few days. So I was, I was born in the Philippines, right? And then right now, Axie Infinity is like a blockchain NFT gaming platform. It's picking up in Asia. And they have like the most volume at the moment compared to MakerDAO, uh, MetaMask, and they made a revenue of 7.6 million in one week. And that's pretty impressive for like a blockchain platform. But then for normal users, for example, some of my friends and family, they were calling me, yeah, I want to play Axie Infinity, but I couldn't get in. You know, how do I actually use this MetaMask? How do I even buy Ethereum? And then they went into the first step. And like, oh my God, I need to change this to a RAP token. What's a RAP token? What's RAP token? And they're like, okay, I changed it to a RAP token. They're like, oh my God, I need to transfer it to my Axie wallet. And there's just like four, so many complicated steps before. I think it was after three hours that they were played the game. But this are gamers, oh, wow. so gamers that's, that's, that's a lot. yeah and gamers understand the value of like difficulty in terms of like you know how to get in there but then for a normal user who is not really gay who's like not really in the gaming space it's hard for them to understand what crypto is so i think we work on the usability of these protocols or just like any products that we're actually putting out there it will go into masses and i think this is where actually coinbase or like Robin Hood does really well. And so for example, I'm gonna plug in because Marvin and I had a side project called Rider. So Rider is, is a, um, you can think of it as a hardware device for decentralized identity and like with a, and we wanna bring crypto to masses. So I think some teams should focus also on usability. And I think we're gonna see more of it in like the next coming years, probably one or two or three years down the line. You see a lot of people focusing on that area. Yeah, I, I think it's just in general, like uh, it just, it, you always have the pioneers at first, uh, the, the early adopters, and then the masses will join in at, at some point. And you see that with, with any technological advancement, be it large or small, you know, like um, I always like to use the example of the TV remote when that just came out, people like, this is absolute nonsense. Like, why would I pay for this thing? I can just walk over to the television, right? And now try to sell a television without a remote. No one's going to buy it, right? Um, and now we have, we have remotes on our phones, so it's even more, much different. And, and same with the internet when it just came out, right? There's that famous interview with, uh, with uh, uh, Bill Gates, and I think was it on Letterman or something like that? And, and Bill Gates was kind of talking about all the use cases of the internet, like, oh, you can look something up or you can order something. And then the guy was just rebutting him at every turn and being like, well, have you heard of a phone book? Have you heard of this? You know, have you heard of the radio? And, and now everyone's using the internet, right? And then mobile phone, same story. Like, why do you need this smartphone? People didn't know how to use it. And now you have kids like this, this small that are doing all these things on their iPads and their phones. And I think we'll, we'll see a crypto generation that, that's going to grow up with crypto and it's going to be second nature to them. Uh, what that's going to look like, um, you know, we can speculate, but uh, I, I think I think it'll come. So part of it is getting rid of that, that uh technical jargon, like, like Lewis says, in, in improving the usability, uh, you know, I think we're just in that early stage. It's like, we're having a prototype mobile phone right now and just, it breaks down sometimes, but it works and it's very promising. And uh, I, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's sort of where we're at. It'll get better over time. This is a very optimistic approach. I like it. This is like, <laughs> we need to work on the simplicity a little bit still. Yeah, like it's not actually a little bit, it's quite a lot. We're all doing <laughs> that. Everybody who works in crypto, including me, including you, we all work at that. Yeah. <laughs> and one more thing that I wanted to ask because we're kind of wrapping up this interview. You talked about the crypto generation that is growing up and kids using smartphones and stuff like that. Well, imagine those kids go into crypto now. Probably they're not five, okay, but they're more like 18-ish. But what do they need to do and what do they need to know to start off at crypto right now? So what's important in your opinion? What's cool? What's not cool to do? And where is it? great to start um 
like as a concrete starting point, it's a little tough to answer. But what, what I would say is like it's it's the same as when when kids were just introduced to to the Internet or, or again to a mobile phone, like with with this great power also comes a responsibility. Right. You have to be mindful of what you post on the Internet and how you use it and uh, and things can go wrong. Right. And it's the same with, with crypto. So I think they're they're we still do need an educational component there, right? Like mobile phones these days are second nature. You can hand this to a kid and the kid will know exactly what to do with it. But uh, that's not the case yet for crypto. So um, it's important that they understand uh, the implications of what it is that they're doing. Um, and then how to get started. I think there's just many different ways that don't necessarily involve uh, money or a lot of money. Uh, like like Lois mentioned, like playing one of these games. I think that's the first step, as arduous as it is. But again, I'll relate this back to like me being young and and hey, there's this online game, and then you got to figure out how to download it and install it and and go through all these hassles. Uh, but you're like, I've seen other people do this. I want to do it too. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's where it starts, and it will it will kind of expand to different people. So. Uh, for a first step, that would really then depend on the person, like what it is they want to do. Do, do they want to play that game? And then they can find the resources and materials on how to do that. Uh, do they want to trade? Well, maybe a different story. Um, but content is out there. And I, and I think like being, being informed and knowing what you're doing is, is, is important. So what do yeah. you think, Luis? No, you start to what Marvin said, because I think what makes crypto difficult is it involves like monetary, you know, like there's, it's a form of money. And by the end of the day, not everybody is going to be good at it. So uh, if you, I mean, for me, I think I was quite, what I call this, like lucky that my parents taught me how, how to say when I was like in first grade, you know, they ask, they give me like allowance every day and I split half, I put half in my coin bank and that's how I learned the value of money. And I think if you're going to do it the same thing with kids, you're just going to tell them, okay, this is like your crypto money. And then you just put it there. And then when they probably have more like maturity, you know, they could go like in different kinds of rabbit hole. You know, if your kid is artistic, put them in the NFT route. If your kid is more like, oh, I can see him do like a really good, he's like a finance guy, do DeFi, go on Dexas, you know? And I think that's the beauty of crypto. You have like different tracks where you could put your kid in, you know? Not every not every kid should do everything, you know? I mean, that will be, they will be like the next Vitalik, but then they could specialize on something because by the end of the day, crypto is like an intersection among across various fields you know and you can pick a specialization out of it it just depends on like what your personality is you know what's your interest at but then yeah i think if i'm gonna advise them you know start with dogecoin <laughs> that's why it's so popular it's a meme it's accessible and then they see the value okay i have some crypto that's why dogecoin became popular because like it's an entry point to crypto easy not expensive and funny yeah but you can, not you a can mess around with your friends <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's it's really it's like a digital equivalent of giving your 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 child some pocket money and they can yeah. go buy some trading cards and then trade it with their friends and stuff like that and through that they they discover some value in money and value in that some cards are are more desirable than others and 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 you know like these these are yeah these are really the first steps to that and it's fundamentally honestly it's the same uh, so yeah. This is a good advice. Actually, I haven't heard, we, we haven't been talking about the perspective of like kids in crypto yet, because I usually ask people to just give advice to all the people starting with crypto. But this is good approach. I like it because like yeah, everybody is a kid when they start something new. So like th th yeah. this makes a lot of sense. This is very like Elon Musk-ish approach. To <laughs> kids, like, I, I like, think, you know, as, as early as we are, I think adults have more than enough resources to get started. There's so many YouTube videos and everything. And it's like going to the bank and being like, hey, I want to open an investing account. And then a guy walks you through the risks and all that. And you understand that because you're an adult and you know that your money is not infinite and all these things, sadly. Um, so I, I think that's OK. You know, so I'm, I'm more interested in the crypto generation and, and when they're I think they're being born today. So <laughs> that will be interesting to see. And actually, on this like very sweet note, we're finishing up this interview for today. Would, would you like to get some message out there as a kind of big end <laughs> of the of the interview? Um, if I'm gonna give a big message, I will probably do some plugins. So if you guys want to build on Stacks, that's what I'm here for. If you want to build on Stacks, check us as like Stacks.co. As Marvin said, we have a grant accelerator program 
accelerator program is tax.ac and then if you want to join our telegram you can also find it at like um community.org slash groups so um th those are some of the things that i want to plug in and you can always find us on discord twitter or telegram yeah that's pretty much it yeah i'm just going to echo that sentiment so uh, if if you're looking for a very open and welcoming community i think uh, stacks is the one as as uh, we talked about at the start of this interview um we landed here and we stuck around so if there's anyone out there doesn't matter how young or how old you are if you have an amazing idea and and you want to find support for it uh the stacks foundation could be a way or you can just enter to the community and there's many other passionate people that will help you get started and uh yeah that's 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 what i would say thank you so much and for everybody who will be watching this interview after we edit it obviously i'm just reminding that today we're we were joined by Louis and by Marvin from Stacks, and it was lovely chatting with you guys. And for everybody who is interested in Stacks, you got to remember that we have Stacks on Stellvex as an asset, and you go check all the social networks and all the websites that Louise and Marvin have mentioned to know more. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>